And good evening, I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Townsend, Montana. I'm Rick Dancer, and this is Get Real with Rick Dancer. We've got a great show for you tonight. We're going to do something a little different. Um, I've got a friend coming on who's going to kind of tell his story, and I think you're going to really enjoy this because it's going to be a, a very uh, real conversation, I promise you. Um, <laughs> maybe more real than some of you are comfortable with, but that's okay because that's what we do here. And Bill uh, London is going to be joining us a little bit later in the show. And he has some news that uh, Betsy Johnson, who's running for governor, uh, made some comments about gun control. And um, now she's kind of pulling back. And this seems like I'm a big fan of Betsy. This seems like this could be like a little bit of a problem for her. So he's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, and that's coming up in just a little bit. Um, our sponsors tonight are Buck Sanitary Service and also Dr. Michael Bratlin with Chris Dental. And Dr. Bratlin recently, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna roll the open to the show and then I'll kind of give you a little more information. Who puts up with this? That's what I don't understand. Bring the lion out, bring the, bring the lion. Um, tonight on our show, we're going to have... Hey guys, don't you think it's kind of fun that you get to comment on the news? Yeah, there's a cost. Oh yeah, there's a cost. People come after you. Like, I think that's why this is so much fun is because... We'll see you at five. And, and I've never really told you guys this. The music on that was created by a kid named Adam the Unknown. And he wrote me, he watches the show. He says, I, I wrote a theme song for you. Do you want to use it? And I heard it and I said, God, that's awesome. Yeah, I do. So um, let's just get real right off the top here. I wrote a, a blog today online and I'm um, getting some criticism from a couple of people um, accusing me of uh, promoting Montana and, at the, and, and dissing Oregon. Um, well, I, I'm not promoting Montana because honestly, I don't want you to come here. <laughs> I came here because it's too cold. It's too windy for most people. And you know, when insects get in the, in the cold, they die and they freeze. Well, see, I, I don't want to have wimpy people coming to, to Montana and changing what they have here. I came here to assimilate and be part of this place. And I'm not here to change it or make it anything, but I sure as hell don't want a whole bunch of people following me here. I know that's kind of hypocritical when I leave Oregon and I come here and now I don't want you to come here either, but that's kind of the Oregon way. <laughs> and then I was talking about Oregon and some of the things that are so screwed up. And uh, one gentleman, good guy, you know, we're having a conversation online and he's like, well, well, you're just, you're, you know, once you leave Oregon, you can't comment about Oregon. Bullshit. I can talk all I want about Oregon or Idaho or Washington or Montana. And this is a program where you can say whatever you want. So um, it's not going to stop me. It doesn't mean I, I don't hate Oregon. I, I hate the control that one party has over Oregon and what it's doing to destroy rural Oregon and people in Oregon that don't have a voice. If you're not, if you live in Oregon and you're not the far, 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 far left, you are nothing and they own the conversation and i got tired of it and that's why we left because here we were sitting in a little bar last night kathy and i signed the final papers on our house went downtown there's a brewery down there in montana they have to close at eight o'clock isn't that weird so yeah breweries have to close at eight o'clock and bars can stay open until two in the morning and it's because a bar license in montana is like a million bucks so you, it's really expensive to have a bar and there's only a certain number. You can, they don't have a ton of them out there. So they're coveted. So when breweries started becoming popular, the, the kind of the, the song and dance they did was, okay, breweries can stay open. You can only serve beer and wine, but you can only stay open until eight o'clock and then you have to close. So then people will go to the bars after that. I know. Hey, Oregon has some pretty stupid laws too. Like you can't pump your own gas. Oh my gosh, I love that about Montana. And so, yeah, I'm promoting Montana now because I can, I'm an adult. I can pump my own gas and nobody's losing their job because of it. And uh, that's been a sales job in Oregon for years. Um, and that's just the craziness. So anyway, um, to, to, that's to, the, to answer the questions for people that were asking online. Um, yeah, I'm going to keep talking about Oregon. I'm going to talk about what's wrong with Oregon um, because if, if you don't change it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die. And I honestly do believe that. Um, and you have to stand up. You have to point out the problems. 
and um, ninety percent of them are coming from your governor and her and her uh, far, far, far left wing. They call themselves progressives. I can't see that any of this is progressive. How is it progressive that gas prices are now in some parts of the country six dollars a gallon? How is? Can you tell me how is that progressive? To me, what this, these people really are is regressive because they're taking us back to inflation that we haven't experienced in 40 years. And what, I'm supposed to stand here and be quiet about it? Hell no, I'm not gonna be quiet about it. They're ruining everything in our country. They're making people not have to work, not want to go to work. Um, no, I'm not gonna be quiet. And, um, and, and that's why I am also getting criticized for a, uh, a billboard that Dr. Bratlin put up. Um, we, yes, with my blessing, I'm not putting the blame on him. Um, he has a billboard and we're going to use it for a lot of other things that are going to piss people off too. So just get used to it. That's what's going to happen. Um, but he put it up thanking Joe Rogan um, for his help. And so I, we had a friend of mine, in fact, the guy who's going to be on the show, Nick, uh, he has also shoots drone photography. So he went out and shot this and I edited this and we're going to pay well, Dr. Bratlin's going to pay. And we're pushing this all over the country uh, for people to see what Springfield, Oregon is doing. Now watch this. Ah, uh, free speech. <laughs> Nick, you did a great job on that. Free speech. Isn't that what it's like, man? Um, and I'll tell you what, we, Kathy and I sat at this little bar last night, walked in, people looked at us and said, where are you guys from? Obviously, we're strangers in a 2200 uh, person town. And by the end of the, the by 830, um, you know, we'd had another beer. They bought it for us. We were talking about life and where we'd come from. And it was like being in rural Oregon. Um, all over again. So it was very, very nice. And it was really fun. And um, nobody asked what party we were in. Hmm. Just didn't come up. So, but nobody really cares. <laughs> That's just kind of how it works. Man, there's a lot of you guys on here. So I'm glad you're here because we got this really kind of in-depth conversation tonight. Um, I'm going to bring Nick in here. Here he goes. This is Nick. Hey, Nick, say hi. Hey, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> so Nick, you know, I was sitting here when I'm thinking I'm having you on. And I was going, I don't even remember how you and I met. Oh, it was uh, my buddy Dean sent you a message because I started the, the Attitude is Everything group. And uh, he said, you got you got to meet this guy. And we went out for lunch and then that was a wrap. We've been friends ever since. Yeah, that's I remember. So, so yeah, they, they, it was a site for people that are in recovery. And they asked me to be on it. And I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm not in, I wanted to be on it. Cause I love talking to people like that. I mean, people who are in recovery are honest, you know, they're, they don't have anything to hide. And so I wanted to be on there, but then I thought, God, it's kind of arrogant of, you know, a guy who's not in recovery to be on a page, you know, and I never go on there and tell people what to do or how to act, but you started the page and then that's how you and I connected. Yeah. So you've had a, you've had a pretty rough past. Oh yeah. It's been a uh, pretty, colorful i'd like to say <laughs> <laughs> so tell to kind of go back and kind of explain to people what um you know when we kind of how this all started for you because so so nick the, what, let me give you like a real headline just so you guys can understand where we're going here um we're going to talk tonight about how when you take time out of your life and give to other people and you make different choices like that and really invest in people um how you can change th your, their lives but how they also turn around and can change your life. And um, so tell, take me back to where this started for you. Well, you know, I have a, I have a severe criminal history. I was involved with meth addiction and, uh, you know, running the streets of, of Eugene Springfield for most of my adolescence and um, young adulthood. I've been to prison four times. Um, and, you know, um, little by slow, it, it things started to change. You know, I started to, you know, um, you, you, lived, you were one of the troublemakers living on the streets of Eugene, stealing people. I mean, I'm gonna help you, stealing people's bikes. Um, yeah. you know, you were you told me one time, I'm the guy you would hate 
if you ran into me on the streets of Eugene. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm sure that you've reported you've when you worked at KEZI. I'm sure you did some uh, reporting KEZI Nine News. <laughs> Today we yeah. had a, you know, I'm sure that you reported uh, a couple of things that 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 um, you know poor choices and poor decisions and and um, not having any willingness to um, to want change. So, um, where did that come from for you? It came from um, broken relationships, you know. Um, when I was in active addiction, I, you know, I felt bad for the things that I did bad, but it was only temporary because I had a mask. The mask was my drugs and, and alcohol. Substance was to, you know, um, to cover that up. Um, but, you know, um, when, you, when you get arrested and you go to jail and you go to prison, for me, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I would sit and think about all of those things and all of the relationships that I damaged and everything that I hurt. And it was a very painful uh, time for me to sit there. Uh, and, and isn't the problem with that, Nick, for, for people? Because you and I have a, a mutual, several mutual friends, actually, who've also been in, in prison and stuff. And, and um, the, the guilt then just resurfaces and then you the only way to deal with that that you know how to anyway is to, to to drug yourself up again or get drunk or do something you know you know what i mean you never yeah it's like it's a snowball effect i mean once you're in the criminal justice system and you got mountains of 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 court debt and and uh different obligations that you've blown off you know it, it just becomes so much that you can't see the the light at the end of the tunnel per se um, so how did you find the light? Well, um, I just got, you know, I, I, for one, I was suicidal several times, um, where, you know, just had burnt every bridge that I ever had and, 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 you know, come to a jumping point per se. Um, I was, you know, thinking about suicide and the only other option besides, uh, taking myself out was to get sober. Uh, because it just wasn't working anymore. And um, I had been to the, you know, I was at the bottom of the bottom and um, it was time for change. So I, I uh, you know, it's been a battle it's, and I've had, I've had multiple years of sobriety and, and then relapsed and went back into it. And it was just like complete chaos. And, and uh, you know, it's, it, it's harder and harder um, to get sober. Um, the more times that you, that you do it, you know? Um, so what I've done now is, is, uh, I got a support group. I, I go to 12 step support groups and, um, on a regular basis and I, and I work with other individuals and, and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a gradual process. Like this, uh, spiritual connection that I have, I didn't have in the very wow. beginning. Um, Cause you did. And you, and you didn't grow up. Um, I mean, you grew up with drugs around you, so it was it was normal. Yeah, it was a lifestyle. I mean, it was around my house. It was you know there was constantly people coming in and out. Um, my dad played music in all the bars and uh, around town, and and you know um, I I basically grew up in the bar life, and there was drugs involved, and there, it was just it was it was just normal. It was what was going on in my household, and and we were told you know, you know, not to say anything about what was going on at home at school and stuff like that. So, it was, you know, it was, um, I was trained to be a liar before, before I even had a chance, you know, <laughs> so, I want you to hold that thought. I'm going to run. I want Buck sanitary services. One of our other sponsors. I want to run something for them. And I want to come back. You were trained okay. to be this. Okay. Hang on there. Just a second. So you say you were trained. Tell me. Yeah. So, me. so I was, I was coached, you know, to lie to people at school and not to say that 
you know, there was stuff going on and that we had a, a weed crop in the basement and, you know, um, and I, I was trained not to talk to cops and, and to not like cops and to, you know, all these different things that were just um, ingrained in me from a very young age. Um, and, and to be irresponsible and to, you know, uh, you know, just watching my parents, you know, it was like they would get high and then they would flake out on obligations, you know? <laughs> and so that was, can you tell us about when you went home, you had to bring dope or so, to get in sometimes. It, well, yeah. My, so my mom, um, you know, there was times where, where I had to bring dope to, just to get in, <laughs> you know, <laughs> When, you know, I'd knock on the door and she'd open the door with a little latch and be like, what do you want? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was, she's like, you got any dope? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I got some, mom. Let me in. <laughs> you know, it's so, cold out here. <laughs> so how do you do, how do you grow up like that and then not be bitter? Because, I mean, there's a lot of people I think that would get like, well, look at the chance you had versus the chance I had. And, and. Well, I was, I, I was very bitter and I held a lot of, um, resentments, uh, towards my mom and towards, um, I mean, towards everybody. It was, you know, it was like the world owed me something in, in a way, you know? Um, and, um, looking back on it all now, you know, I'm really grateful for all of it because, um, my, my past is my biggest asset that I have today. Okay. Why explain that to people? Well, um, with all this experience, with all of the, of, of the, the pain and, and carnage that I've caused, um, I have, I have, uh, been taught by others to look inside of myself and, and find out where all of these, um, instincts have went astray, you know, and these natural God given instincts that I have. And, um, you know, to, to, you know, make a list of, of all the stuff that I did and, and then go make amends for all the things that I did wrong and, and for everything that I could remember. And, um, to be honest about, about all of my past, um, and that co doing that, um, with, a, with another individual kind of like opened up the door for, for me to be okay with myself. Um, you know, to, to finally forgive myself and to forgive others for, for things that they had done to me and for, and to go make amends with all of these uh, people that I had harmed, you know, and. Um, Brenda wants to know, do you have a relationship with your parents today? So my mom um, passed away um, um, January 7th, 2020. Uh, 2021, excuse me. She died from dementia, um, which was early onset dementia from using drugs for multiple years. And dementia runs in the in the family. Um, my dad, I actually found my dad um, deceased when I was 18 years old. We um, we were partying, and I can't. I had to leave to go to work the next day, and uh, I left to go to work. And I came back and he was dead on the couch. And you had, a, a, I mean, didn't you kind of have a, about an okay relationship with him? Yeah. My dad was very loving and affectionate and, um, you know, he was a horrible father, but he was the best friend you could ever have. Right. And you needed a dad, but you got a friend. Yeah. I think I was more his dad. <laughs> like so my dad, my dad was disabled. He had prosthetic hips. And so I took, I took care of a lot of the, the bills and the, you know, he had the money coming in from the VA pension. Um, but I, you know, we, I would do a lot of the shopping and a lot of the, the laundry and, and, and stuff for us. So. So one of the things that you've taught me and, and I've learned from my other felon friends, <laughs> my felon friends is, um, that um, some some really weird thing because for you. So, so, and, and, and I'm not speaking against the criminal justice system, but we just have a really weird system where, because a lot of cops in the prisons helped you. I mean, and, and you're friends with a lot of police officers that I'm friends with. Now we met them in different ways and on different sides of the bars. Yeah. <laughs> but 
but you, you know what I mean? And, and, and like, can, can we talk about the sex offender thing? Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. So Nick is called, it's, it's called a sex offender, but it, now, so most of us would believe, and this is when I first heard this from Nick, I thought, Oh, you, most of us would believe that that was, you know, like something really weird or something, but, it, but it really was, you <laughs> tell them what you did. <laughs> well, there was, there was a couple different instances, but, um, I actually, um, got a sex offense for, um, the Eugene police station used to be downtown, um, Eugene. And, and I had got a couple tickets from this officer and I was a total jerk to him and, and the jail happened to be full. So he cited and released me on like a violation of park rules and like, uh, drinking and, uh, open container charge and, and some other stuff. Um, and so I looked, I remembered looking over at his, at his patrol car, um, number. And, um, I went down to the, to the Eugene police, uh, department and I went down below where they used to park their cars. And I seen his car sitting there in the front and I got up on the hood and I pulled my pants down and took a crap right on his, the hood of his cop car. Um, and for that, Nick was qualified as a sex offender. And I think that people need to understand that, that if and a felon, if they're caught peeing in the park, because your because your genitals are exposed, you're then a sex offender. Um, and and there's yeah. room that and weird stuff that I think really is. And it's damaging to you because you're trying when you try to move on. You can't because you have this thing and that's that's something that people are really afraid of they look at that to hire you and they're like oh a sex offender good god well no it's because you know i mean yeah, it's a misdemeanor sex offense but it's it, it, you know there's a lot of people out there like that or or uh you know there's you could get it for peeing in the park you could get it for <laughs> you know all kinds of different things that aren't specifically you know uh i My people would think you know yeah taking advantage of a woman or doing something like that um, in those, in those contexts. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about the positive. So um, that, that kind of sets you up as a, who you, how you got to where you are and that kind of stuff. But um, Nick is such a, I mean, I love you to death. You are like the greatest <laughs> guy. And, and um, when Nick hugs you, it's like the, it's like a super hug. You know what I mean? You feel loved and um, you, you relapsed, you and I were friends and then you were, everything was going great. And then you relapsed big time. Yeah. And so I got, I got injured at work. I have, I had a, a neck surgery and, and, um, was, I was involved in recovery and stuff. And, and I, I was going to, to 12 step groups all the time and, and doing that on a regular basis. And, and, uh, you know, when the, when the neck injury happened, it happened in October of 19. So it was like, I was already on quarantine before quarantine started. Um, cause I was on the couch and you know, my, first of all, my, my attitude changed. I had, I started to have a, a poor me attitude. I started to, um, stop, stopped going to my, to my support groups and I stopped, uh, contacting, uh, my, my support network. And, um, you know, it was, it was them. It was this, it was that it was, uh, my fingers were pointing at everybody except, um, uh, me, you know, I was feeling sorry for myself. And so, um, it all started with, uh, the, the medication that I got after my surgery. And, um, I started taking more than I was supposed to. And, um, I was started to get prescriptions that I, you know, that I, um, wasn't telling anybody about, and I started eating more than I was supposed to, and it wasn't working for me. Um, and so I relapsed, um, and it was about, I would say, uh, you know, a week to two weeks, uh, full out relapse. Um, and I still had pretty good insurance for my work. I was on, uh, a workman's comp situation. So I wasn't working, but I, I still had insurance through my work through, um, uh, FEMLA, you know, uh, family medical leave, right. um, the Oregon family medical leave act anyways. Um, and you know, 
I just didn't want I, I had I didn't want to lose everything that I had worked really hard to get because really you have he has a woman in his life um, been together for a guy quite a while yeah for she's a recovery she's a counselor at a, for a recovery agency mm -hmm. and, and, and she has a daughter that's not your biological daughter but basically she's your daughter yeah and you had let those two down and what mm -hmm. I love about, about her is she said out yeah you can't, you can't she told, well she she gave me she said okay so what are we gonna do you know i told her that i had relapsed and um she said okay well if you if you use again you gotta you gotta leave and so then uh i i used again and i told her and she said okay well you gotta go so i packed up my stuff and i and i um went and stayed with a friend which she was really um didn't want me to stay there well she would she would always let me stay but she didn't she uh felt uneasy about it and and uh she let me stay reluctantly um and about a week in over there um i called my insurance to see who my my uh, treatment provider was and it happened to be um betty ford hazelden in palm springs california well um and that's one of the best programs in the country <laughs> yeah. that you end up in okay so i'm gonna, I'm gonna help you. nick ends up in one of the best programs in the country for recovery and it's paid for by his insurance it's and honestly like celebrity rehab i mean we had there was like when i was there um there was a couple times where paparazzi was popping up over the trees and like trying to get pictures of people. And I won't say any names because I don't want to break their anonymity, but there was some celebs in there with me. Um, but you in, in the process of this, so Nick has the guts to, to throw himself into recovery. He goes down to California, checks into this place and you meet a, a friend. Um, and we won't use his name because that's we can use his name. His name's Fred. Okay. We'll so meet Fred. We'll call him uh, Fred. <laughs> and, Fred, and Fred turns out to be a very wealthy man, <laughs> but yeah. it doesn't matter. Wealth and poorness, it, when, when you're an addict or you're in recovery, you're all, everybody's the same. It's kind of like you take, you put your pants on the same way. Well, when I, when I met Fred, um, he had just came out of detox and he had um, multiple years of sobriety, but I didn't know any of this. Um, he just, when he would start to speak, he, he couldn't speak because he would start to cry and he would get all choked up um, because he was going through a, a nasty divorce and he was, you know, he had, he had picked up and relapsed and he was just full of guilt and shame over this, this relapse. And, and this, you know, he, he used to go around to, um, he, he met a, a new wife and well, they got married and she liked to go wine tasting and he was in recovery. He was in sobriety. And um, so he would go with her to do wine tasting, but he wouldn't uh, participate. And then right. finally he started to taste it and then he would spit it into the spittoon. They have, you know, a spittoon. Right. Um, and then after a while he started swallowing it and then, you know, and then uh, multiple years of drinking began again. But anyways, when I met him, he, uh, he would just start to cry. And so I went up after went to went up to him after group. And I was like, Hey man, I was like, if you want to, they had this beautiful campus, you know, like palm trees everywhere. And there's a huge koi pond with all these fish and like different kinds of birds and stuff. And I was like, Hey, if you want to go walk and talk, I would love to talk with you. And he said, I would love to do that. And so um, we started the next day. He, you know, he was still like super had tremors and like was coming off alcohol pretty hard and uh, he'd have a hard time walking and stuff. So I would like kind of put my arm around him and like help him around the around the pond, you know, and. Uh, he started telling me about, you know, all the birds and all the fish and he told me their name and where they originated and what their scientific name was and he knew about the trees and like i was like this i could tell he was like super intelligent you know and um but, but you had like a moment with god there like, oh yeah 
it was it was a total spiritual experience right from the very first time i i sat down outside to take my uh covid test but you have to take a, a instant covid test to get in this is back in in uh um december in november of 2020 or um uh, what year is it? Yeah, <laughs> November of 2020. Because it'll and be so all up two years coming up in November. So you guys become friends, and and um, and your program ends, and he then, if I recall the story right, he then paid for you to go to the next program, so that yeah. you guys be in there together. Yeah. So we went. So there's these uh, this recovery houses that are associated with Betty Ford and they're called, it's called Daisy Lane. And it's like, I'm talking, uh, these are nice upscale houses, like hot tubs in every yard, you know, what I mean? like super nice. Like your lady comes in and cleans for, for us every day. And like, <laughs> it was, wow. it was super, super cool. So we finished the work that we set out. And so, there's only there's there's only uh, there's a specific way that I have to talk about twelve step groups. So it's kind of you know. So I went through a, a twelve step, um, the twelve steps with him, which I, I I can't really elaborate on besides um, right. vaguely um, per the traditions um, of the program. So. Um, so the two of you go through this program together and become really good friends. Yeah. And, and so he takes me through, he takes me through the 12 steps and, um, he lets me, um, have squirrels and he lets me, you know, lose track of what we're talking about. And he, he, he just is really patient with me and he brings me back to the topic and, um, come to find out that, you know, um, Fred, um, was a doctor and he was a, he was a neonatal, um, doctor. So he owned his own practice and, and it was a specialty unit where he worked in the NICU and he was the lead doctor. Um, so Nick, I want to, I want to speed you up here. Cause what I want to get to the point of what okay. I, wanna, I really want to talk to you about here too is so anyway, this, you and this doctor still keep in contact with each other. Yep. Um, recently he relapsed mm -hmm. and you were there and actually nursed him back to health. I did. I was. I went and I did some work for him, and I built a couple fences. And um, I went back, and um, I found Fred in a blackout, drunk. He he never showed up in at the airport to pick me up. So I Ubered to his house, and and that's where I found him. And how much and, did you spend on that Uber? Four hundred and thirty dollars. <laughs> so Nick takes an Uber. The guy's not there. And Nick knows this guy well enough because they're friends, they're brothers, and he knows that he would be there if he could. So Nick takes a risk, pays an Uber, four hundred dollars to drive, however the hell far from that Sacramento, way. from Sacramento to Turlock, <laughs> California, <laughs> and and then finds this Fred blacked out, and then helps him back to health. So I just and got him cleaned up, and I got him, you know, uh, got him in the shower, and then I put him in the bed, and I cleaned the whole house and and got everything back in working order got rid of all the booze and, and so uh, then later um nick sends me a picture of a beautiful pickup truck um that fred out and out just said you need a truck and you you know nick wants to, is starting now a gutter business and he needed a truck and fred bought him a truck um, well, he bought he bought me a, a really nice uh, 2017 Ram uh, turbo diesel with um, it's warranted and and he also has um, he has been helping me immensely. I got a settlement for my neck and and I I used all the money to buy a gutter machine and and Fred has been helping me um, with all of the other purchases. Uh, that I needed to get started because he knows that if I um, have all of these things set in place, that I will be successful, and that he um, he is. I can't I can't even thank him enough. I mean I I can't even this the biggest blessings 
I could even ever imagine, you know, I never would have ever thought that something like this would happen to me. So Nick, what do you learn about life? I mean, about helping people? Well, you just, you just never know um, who you're going to run into and what's going to happen and what, what God's plan is, you know? Um, I've had a lot of ups and downs in my life and it's been a, it's been a real uh, tough journey. Um, but you know, um, everything happens for a reason, I do believe. And this is, if you could go back to Nick at eight, 10 years old, what would your advice as the man you are today, what would your advice be to him? Well, honestly, I wouldn't want to go back and say any, anything because I think everything happened perfectly and every, everything happened so beautifully. Um, I have a really amazing life today. I, I have a beautiful home. I got a beautiful family. Um, I, I have, I'm not on any kind type of parole or probation. I don't owe the courts anything. Um, I have, I've paid off, paid my dues, so to speak. And, um, I'm on to my new venture. This, this dream that I've had for a long time to start my own business is real and it's happening right now. And Nick has also like um, the guy that it, when somebody gets out of prison and he, he'll, there used to be a page that I don't think they have, I don't know if they do anything anymore. I think it's illegal to do this now with the mugshot page, Lane County mugshots. And Nick would watch that page and wait for, <laughs> he'd see people that he knew or been to prison with. And then he'd show up at the jail and pick them up. Um, yeah. Well, I would see when people would were in jail and then I would call down there people that I care, you know, there's a lot of people that I care about um, that I used to, to get, get loaded with. And there, there's been, you know, it's not, I haven't been very successful, but I think that I actually have been pretty successful because I've had a couple guys that I went down there and I picked up and, uh, one of them is my friend Spike and he is still sober and, you know, he, he, he thanks me every day for going and getting him um and getting him on the right track because now he's he's got a he's got a harley he's got a driver's license he's got a great job he he runs a recovery house he's just you know he he is uh he is exactly why i do that because if i can do it anybody can <laughs> so, so what um what do people need nick well, um, they just need love, love and support, you know, and not, you, you know, when people were harping on me saying, oh, you need to get clean. Oh, you need to do this. It was like, that was when I rebelled more. It seemed like, um, it was, you know, finding the right, the people at the right time, you know, when they're willing to listen and willing to, uh, take some simple suggestions is a big deal. Um, and I think you told me once that, and, and correct me, tell me if I'm saying this and it's not true, but please correct me because I, but I think prison was what got, what really stopped. I mean, it, it, that, that did, even though you went several times, I mean, but prison being in jail is where you started getting the help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was some, there was several different things that I was involved in that I think, um, helped, you know, um, I was in, I was involved with a, a a study that was that was put on by the David Lynch Foundation that was uh, transcendental meditation. Well, I was I was one of the recipients and learned how to do TM, and um, and I still use TM on a regular basis. But that was when I really um, things started to change for me. So, do people? All people have value. Everybody has value. I don't treat anybody, you know, even there's, you know, people all over this town. I mean, I don't look at anybody any different, you know, even if they're flailed out, just like I see pictures and people posting pictures of people doing weird stuff on the side of the road. Well, um, do a little bit of meth and that can be you. <laughs> right. Meth is a bad drug, isn't it? Yeah, but I've also seen, I know, I mean, I have, 
hundreds of friends that I used to run these streets with that are all clean and sober and they're doing wonderful. Um, and they're, they're upstanding citizens in this community. Um, so, um, you know, so define, you define, know. define hope. What does hope mean? Hope is, um, the only thing, um, define hope. Wow. That's pretty big. So, uh, you know, Hope is is uh, is more powerful than the contrary, um, <laughs> right? So, Nick, you are like the greatest guy. Well, thanks, Rick. I love you, man. And and uh, love you too. You know, I I don't really like say, you know going and and saying, oh well, I. Today I went and helped my neighbor lady. Um, <laughs> but you do so much. Unload, you know, uh, eight yards of bark mulch and spread it around the yard. But you know, that's the type of things that I do. And I do a steamable wax, and it makes me feel better. And then I don't have to go and I tell everybody about it. Um, it makes me feel better as a person. Um, I'm, all of my neighbors here that I live around, they love me to death. I I, I have open door policy with almost everybody in my block and i'm i'm uh neighbors to you know teachers and doctors and district attorneys and um you know and they all um uh, just absolutely love me and i love them you know and i just nick, nick has gone on stories with me like to jail stuff and to the forest work camp yeah the veterans legacy forest work camp and he goes <laughs> in and he and dan buckles are going hey I remember it used to be a prison. <laughs> You're in jail with me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I repped this uh, Veterans Legacy shirt because I think it's important to, you know, that program is doing some amazing things out there for for the community and, and for the veterans that are lost. You know, the ones that are on the corner holding the sign and and you know the right. government isn't there to help. So um, here's these people that better have created this program out there at Camp Elma that um, that are making something happen. Nick, thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time and your heart and just who you are. And um, yeah, I am your brave soul. <laughs> All right. We'll see you later, Nick. All right. Take care, everybody. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. How's that? That was a that was a real show. <laughs> Nick is the greatest guy, and he just does all kinds of stuff for people. And I mean, he's just um, I, I mean, I learned from him because he'd tell me things he did, and I thought, God, I don't do that, you know. And and I think it's a great example um, of what you can do, you know. Um, and I think it also gives hope to people because I think it's really easy in our culture to give up on people, um, but enough people didn't give up on Nick. And then he becomes better. And then he's, he then returns that. God, if, if we could learn that right now in our culture today, it'd be life changing. Um, we could do so many things better. So we're going to do more interviews like that because I think we all need a little bit of that. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. We're going to go to Bill London with his newscast and then we'll be back. Hey, if you guys share this on your page because you never know if someone is in a situation like Nick was, or just looking for hope. You don't know how much it can get just from sitting and listening to that conversation with Nick. So just post it on your page, just share it right now. It'll go right to your page and you don't have to promote it or anything. Just stick it out there and see what they say. We'll be back in just a few minutes after Bill's news. Good evening from the news radio, 1120 AM and 93.7 FM KPNW studios. I'm Bill London, Host of the Wake Up Call, heard Monday through Friday mornings, 6 a.m. to 9 on KPNW, streaming at kpnw.com. All right, here is a look at some of the stories we're following. Well, I'm beginning to think that probably Betsy Johnson is regretting showing up at the TEDx conference in Portland. Betsy Johnson, of course, is the unaffiliated candidate for governor, and she made, as we told you last night, a surprise May 27th appearance during the Ideas Conference of TEDx Portland. Well, Johnson's comments on gun control 
angered a number of people in the crowd. And they objected to TEDx providing an audience of thousands to one of three candidates for Oregon governor. And they're claiming that's a violation of federal tax code that prohibits a 501c3 nonprofit, which TEDx is, from participating in political campaigns. So in the aftermath, seven people have now filed complaints with the Oregon Department of Justice, which oversees Oregon nonprofits. A spokesperson for the DOJ, Christina Edmondson, said her agency is forwarding those complaints to the IRS, which polices nonprofits and determines their legal status. I'm sure this is a story that's not going to go away, as well as her comments on gun control. Now, some members of the crowd got, well, irate with Johnson because Johnson has been a supporter of gun rights for her entire political career, voting against stricter gun regulations. Now, Johnson describes herself and her husband as gun collectors. And at the TEDx talk, she took a hardline stance against gun control, saying there was no point in criminalizing different types of weapons. Because as we told you yesterday, she said the style of the gun does not dictate lethality. That elicited boos from gun grabbers in the crowd. Now Johnson has decided in the aftermath that she favors apparently stronger background checks, at least stronger than the ones she voted against when she was in the legislature. She's not really offering specifics except for a couple of which we'll get to. In a press release, Johnson says, as governor, I'll look to law enforcement and other experts in this field to propose improvements to our current background check system. Legislators from both parties will weigh in with their ideas. For certain, we need better data, faster response, and more integrated information across states and among institutions to ensure guns are kept out of the hands who should not have them. What exactly does that mean? Who knows? She does say, my willingness to support new laws reflects my belief that as governor, I need to represent the views and concerns of all Oregonians and not merely my own. She says, if I'm asking others to compromise, I need to lead by example and practice what I preach. What she does say is she's not adverse to raising the age to buy certain guns. Probably in that case, we're talking about ARs. Speaking of guns, since we're on the subject, Oregon State Police last year conducted 338,300 background checks on prospective gun buyers, a drop from 2020 when the state recorded the most, 418,061. Yet last year's number was still far greater than the background checks in each of the three previous years from 2017 to 19. For the past 25 years, less than 2% of people in Oregon trying to buy a gun have been denied due to a failed background check, according to the state police re latest report on Tuesday. Last year, 95% or 320,735 of the purchases were approved after background checks were done. Last year, state police approved uh, 320,735 purchases and denied 1,129 after conducting background checks. So who gets denied? Well, if a person was convicted of a felony, was on probation for a criminal con conviction, or had been convicted of domestic abuse. Also, there were 58 people who had been previously committed to mental health institutions who were turned down, and another 100 were denied because the guns sought for sale came back as having been stolen. Official, officials in Clackamas County said they have now finished duplicating the majority of primary election ballots that were rejected by vote counting machines because of a printing error on tens of thousands of ballots. Election officials in Clackamas expect to finish tallying the vote by the end of the week and to certify all election results by June 13th, the state's deadline. The outlook for prospective Oregon home buyers is worse now than any time since 2007. According to a new report by the Oregon Employment Department, the OED says a short supply of houses, soaring inflation, interest rates, and inflation have pushed many prospective buyers completely out of the market. 
Mark Lane County is yet another county that's suggesting that its residents mask up because of Omicron surging. Lane County is saying that the numbers of COVID-19 have surpassed the Delta surge of 2021. As a result, Lane County public health officials are recommending that everyone mask up again. Dr. Patrick Ludke with Lane County Public Health says the numbers that Lane County is seeing is significant. Now, Lane can only recommend you mask up. Only the governor can reinstate any mandates, and currently there's no plans in the works to do so because we're going into election season. And grab your crab pots, your fishing rods, and your bait. Oregon is celebrating three fishing days this weekend. And that annoying sound is my phone, which I'm going to have to answer. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Rick. Get real. <laughs> I love it. That's what I love about doing this. Everything just stays that way. Hey, Dr. Bratlin predicted it. He has that commercial up saying, you wait till the fall. It'll happen after the election, though, but uh, before they start forcing masks back on. But uh, everybody I know, it's a, it's a bad cold. But there's the health department recommending Lane County mask up again. Um, wow. I, I, you know. I'm sorry. At the beginning of the show, we talked about not trying not to compare Montana and Oregon, but I'll tell you what, um, where I'm living right now, that's probably not going to happen. And, um, oh God, I feel bad for you guys. What a horrible thing. Well, tomorrow night we got Jake. And remember Jake, he was walking across America. Well, he's a little bit past Boise. He's been keeping in contact with me. And so we're going to talk to him tomorrow. Um, I recommend they find their own. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Gary. We're going to talk with him. We also have a really charming interview with some, some of the clients and, and folks being held by Albert Taylor. And we're going to hear about the endless possibilities that they give to them. Uh, so that's tomorrow night. Next week, I um, heard on Lars Larson today, I heard a guy uh, named Andy uh, speaking out against um, different gun laws and making some really good points. So I've notified his office. I think we're going to get him for Monday. I'm hoping we get him. On Monday, and I have a little boy who uh, had a pretty serious injury, and he's uh, looking for some help. And so his mom wanted me to post something. I said, "No, let's bring him on the show. Let's see what he has to say." So we're going to do a lot more of that in the future because I think that's where it's at for all of us. Is let's hear stories like Nick's tonight about real people doing real things and really surviving. All right, have a good night. Share this on your page, please. That really helps us. And um, of course, and then patronize all of our. Um, not patronize, patronize all of our sponsors. All right, we'll see you later. See you tomorrow night. Have a good, have a good rest of your day and a good day tomorrow.